Hello and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. In this video I will pose the question what is language and I will compare human language to a variety of different animal communication systems. Before we get into that I would like to briefly review the seven things that linguists know about language from last time. So um, what do linguists know? They know that language is uniquely human. That will be the main topic for this video. They know that language is a system of rules and regularities that speakers subconsciously master. They know that language is creative, that language is a system of a finite number of elements and regularities that allows you to uh, produce an infinite number of sentences that express an infinite number of new ideas. We know that language is social, <clears throat> uh, so that speakers talk differently in different situations and uh, how you talk that says something about uh, who you are. We also know that language changes all the time uh, and that that is the natural state of a living language. We know that languages are genetically related, that languages have ancestor languages, sister languages, and that languages over time may die out. And we know that there are no primitive languages. There are no languages without grammar. All languages that we know of are fully fledged grammatical systems. With all this in mind, I would like to get to the main question for this video, how is human language different from animal communication systems? And uh, there has been a famous American linguist, Charles Hockett, who addressed this question in a paper called The Problem of Universals in Language. Now he was mainly concerned with the idea of what's universal in human language, what features are shared by all human languages. And um, in order to get at this issue, he came up with a number of things that he called design features. Design features of language, structural traits that languages have in common. And those he contrasted with animal communication systems. Okay, why is it useful to talk about these design features? Well, um, there are very, very sophisticated animal communication systems. And uh, in order to argue that these are not language, you need very comprehensive criteria. You need good ideas, good arguments to say that, well, those really are not language. Right, so let's talk about design features of language. A first feature, I'm going to talk about 15 of these, okay, 15. Um, Charles Hockett actually had more, but these 15, I think, are the most important ones. So, first feature, mode of communication. Human language, in its basic natural habitat, uh, uses two channels. Either a vocal auditory channel, that's the case in spoken language, or a tactile visual channel, that's the case in sign language. Now you might say, well, what about writing? Well, writing, something different something different. Writing really is a technological innovation. Speech is more basic. Everybody learns to speak. Not everybody learns to write. Uh, not all languages are written. Some languages don't have uh, a written record, a writing system. But still, that's human language. Okay? So, um, in these design features, we'll take spoken language between actual people to be the basic natural form of language. Right. Um, some animal communication systems also draw on these two channels, the vocal auditory or the tactile visual channel, but there are some animal communication systems that work differently. For instance, uh, communication in ants uh, works with, with chemicals, so that's the chemical olfactory um, com communication channel and by this fact that it's neither vocal auditory nor tactile visual 
we can exclude ANS communication from the range of languages. Okay. Second criterion, second uh, design feature. The broadcast of human language is directional. A message of a human speaker is directed towards a hearer, a sign viewer, or indeed a reader if you're, you're doing writing. Um, this has been described as a so-called tight beam transmission. Okay, you, you have to be in the right place to get the message. The message may either hit the recipient or it may miss the recipient. <clears throat> Of course, with technological innovation, there are exceptions. Think of language in mass media. If I say something uh, to a video camera, I'm not exactly sure who's going to end up seeing what I'm saying. Um, now, you know, post something on Facebook, all the world might be able to receive it. Animals don't say things to video cameras very often. They don't use the internet very often. Uh, still, their communication is often radiant, not tight beam, but rather reaching out to anybody who's there. Think of bird cries, a bird sits on a tree, utters a bird cry, everybody who's there can hear it. Uh, think of a dog pissing on a tree, everybody who's there to sniff the tree gets the message. So, we can distinguish human language being directional, tight beam, and animal communication systems like pissing on trees. Well, it's not tight beam, it's radiant, and so it's not language. Third design feature is quite related to this. Uh, human language rapidly fades. A spoken or assigned message of a speaker uh, lasts practically just a couple milliseconds. Okay, I say it and poof, it's gone. So not only do you have to be there at the right place, you also have to be there at the right time to get the message. Again, writing is different. Facebook is different. Talked about this. Um, animal communication systems. There are some that are relatively permanent, even in the absence of Facebook and whatnot. So again, territorial markings, the color of feathers. So this bird has a beautiful red plumage and that's not rapidly fading that stays there for at least the mating season okay I don't know anything about birds but let's say you know, it's not going to be there red for a second and then poof turning gray again no so it's more permanent and by virtue of being permanent we can say that's not language also the ants pheromones I mean they're fading after a while but still a more permanent than uh, speech or sign. The fourth criterion is interchangeability. When humans talk or sign, they are transmitters and receivers at the same time. Okay, it's a rapid back and forth. I say something, you say something, somebody else says something. And so we're all transmitters and receivers at the same time. And for successful communication, this uh, back and forth is actually quite crucial. So you always give these minimal responses like, uh-huh, oh, really, hmm. Um, here's a little experiment. Try to not do these little back channel signals, as they're called. Try not to give minimal responses for a day and see how everybody reacts. All right. Um, Again, writing is the exception. Writing is unidirectional, not back and forth. Well, again, there are exceptions. So, chat rooms and whatnot. Well, <clears throat> now, interestingly, animal communication tends to be asymmetric. There are animal communication systems that are asymmetric. Think of the color of feathers where, um, well, say one species has a certain color of, of feathers and this is a signal to somebody else, uh, they're not necessarily responding back with their own color of feathers, right? And then in a uh, bird song, there are male bird cries. So it's the male being the transmitters and the females being the receivers. Uh, 
Think how absurd that would be with human language, you know? Only the male's talking, the, male, the female's only listening. That's not language. It's nice to hear in your garden, but it's not language. Complete feedback, the, 15, uh, the, the fifth design feature. Um, human language transmitters hear what they are transmitting. As I'm talking, I hear what I'm talking. Um, so I perceive what I'm producing. There's a feedback loop. And uh, you see, when I introduced the slide, I said design feature 15, and I heard 15. Oh, no, 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 that's wrong. Design feature 5 is what I wanted to say. So if there are errors, I can correct myself because I hear what I have been saying. Um, many animal communication systems have no complete feedback. For instance, uh, here are two uh, stickleback uh, fish, yeah, and sticklebacks, they have a peculiar courtship dance in which the male stickleback shows the female their nice red bellies, okay? It's, it's, it's weird, okay? It's, I'm not trying to explain why they do this, I'm just telling you. That's what they do, sticklebacks. And obviously, the male stickleback has never in his life seen his own belly. Think about that. He has not the faintest clue that the belly is red. Amazing. So there's no complete feedback in the way that, you know, I hear what I'm saying to you. Um, yeah, a more graphic example perhaps uh, you know monkeys showing their behinds to uh, other monkeys as a sign of submissiveness all right you're right you're, you're winning I show you my back um, you don't see your own back at that point in time also butterfly colors if you think of butterflies and their colorful patterns maybe doing some mimicry or something um, they don't see that themselves. It's a message that's outward, but they don't see it themselves. No complete feedback. So that, we might say, that's communication, but it's not language. Okay, uh, semanticity. Here it gets interesting. Um, the units of human language are symbolic. That is, they stand for something other than themselves. Um, so, uh, the example that's always given is the word tree. The word tree refers to something, a tree, but there's nothing in the sound tree that would make it uh, refer to trees inherently. Okay, It's a convention. And of course the word for tree uh, is a different one in other languages. So there's nothing in the sound tree that makes it tree-ish. Yeah? Am I making sense? Compare that to non-symbolic animal communication systems. So for instance, dogs tend to express uh, their attitudes towards intruders by showing teeth and barking. And um, well, that's communication, but it's not symbolic communication. It's not like the teeth symbolically stand for something else. It's rather, okay, I'm, I'm showing you the teeth with which I am going to bite you if you move any further into my territory. <clears throat> and the barking doesn't mean anything abstract. It's just a sound that, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, that accompanies this mouth-opening gesture. Right. Semanticity. Um, closely related to semanticity is the design feature of arbitrariness. Arbitrary that means that okay, there's nothing inherent, it's rather symbolic social convention. Um, the associative tie between a form, that is a word, and what that word means is independent of any physical or other resemblance between the two. As I said, nothing in the word tree resembles an actual tree. And, uh, even the signs of signed languages are arbitrary. You might say, well, there are some 
resemblances. Um, but really, uh, if you observe signers conversing in signed language, you have no chance of understanding what's going on if you, if you don't know the language. So the signs are arbitrary. Um, many animal communication systems are non-arbitrary. I've already mentioned mimicry, that is, um, well, here's a caterpillar, and actually this is the behind of the caterpillar, and the behind looks conspicuously like a snake's head. So the you, you could say, well, the, the caterpillar is pretending to be something more dangerous than it actually is. Um, okay, so that's not arbitrary, on the contrary. The caterpillar is trying to mimic something. So the sign and its referent, the snake, they look similar. They look almost identical. It looks like a pretty cool snake's head to me. Yeah, and also apes displaying their behinds. I'll, I'll leave the gory details to you to figure that out. Okay, um, next point, discreteness. The units of human language differ categorically from one another, um, particularly in the area of phonology. Human language is made up of phonemes that differ categorically from one another. So the word bed means something very different from the word bad. Okay? Bed, bad. The two sounds are not that different from one another. You might say, well, you know, they're just um, quite similar sounds, but the two words refer to two very different ideas. So there's no middle interpretation between bed and bad. Uh, it has to be either one or the other. Now, <clears throat> animal communication systems don't have this discreteness. Um, so in animal communication systems, things are usually so that there's a middle interpretation. Think of bees dance. Um, again, there will be more on bees dance. Um, they be, the bees, they, they dance in little eights. And um, the speed with which they dance means something, and the angle in which the eight is arranged, that means something. Um, and between being uh, tilted like this and being tilted like that, there's a middle interpretation, okay? Right. Um, here's an ape gesturing, a chimp, and the size of the gesture and the length of how long you uh, carry out the gesture that means something and between carrying it out very big and very long uh, and carrying it out very small and not so long there's a middle interpretation discreteness the ninth design feature of language displacement um, human language is used to communicate about things that may be remote in space and time so you can use language to talk about things that you remember from the past or indeed you could talk about things uh, that are completely fictional things that you would do if you were invisible for a day think about it now animal communication systems are typically restricted to the here and now the bees dance the bees are coming into the hive and they're doing their little dance and the dance is about food that is in the area just now. It's rare, no, it's completely absent from the record that bees on a cold winter's day do a little bees dance and say, remember that food late August? Man, it was awesome. They don't do that. They don't do that. Baboons showing their behinds, another thing. Um, they, they don't show their behinds to, you know, to evoke memories from uh, days past uh, where they were submissive to, to someone else. It just doesn't happen that way. Okay, so animal communication typically restricted to the here and now, human language open to things that are remote in space and time. 
Okay, uh, tenth design feature, openness. This has to do with the creativity of language. So new linguistic messages are coined freely and easily. Uh, so you can say, you can, you can form new words um, if you so wish. You can express, you can use existing words to uh, form, to express new ideas. Um, and animal communication systems typically have a closed repertoire. Um, there are certain monkey species who have a repertoire of warning calls, and these warning calls are quite sophisticated. They have a different call for uh, dangers that come from the ground, say a snake or um, a big cat, yeah, and dangers that come from the air, some predatory birds. And so depending on what warning cry you hear, you go to a different hiding place. If the snake um, warning call comes, you know, you jump up the tree as fast as you can. If you hear the air warning call, you go to some shelter as fast as you can. Um, here I've given you a picture of electric fish. They look ugly, but they can communicate in a cool way. Um, they use electro communication uh, for things like species recognition. Oh, it's useful for mating, or they use it for attack warning, or they can use it for submission. So complex social stuff that you wouldn't really expect in these fellas, but they have it. But it's not language because there's a limited repertoire. These guys don't make up new messages, new ideas, or come up with new symbols. Um, so for these fish, maybe it would be useful to have a new warning call for submarines, okay? But no, that doesn't happen. Tradition. Tradition is a design feature of language as the conventions of language are passed down from generation to generation by learning. Every new generation learns the language spoken by the older, by the previous generation, and there is continual change as uh, the new generation figures out how language works and develops some conventions that are particular to the new generation. Animal communication doesn't tend to be uh, transmitted in this way. Rather, it's that animal communication systems are genetically inherited. Think of the stickleback courtship dance. Or think of um, these fireflies, like in this picture, bioluminescence. That is not learned. I would love to learn how to, you know, um, illuminate my behind, but I can't. I can't. It's genetic. I have no chance. Here's a complicated one. The duality of patterning. Human language has, um, at least, two levels of structure. One level of phonemes, small number of units that do not mean anything in themselves, but that distinguish meanings. Think again of bed versus bad, but also cat versus cap. T -p. These things don't mean anything by themselves, but in the context of cat and cap, they distinguish meaning. <clears throat> so human language has this phonetic, phonological organization, and uh, human language has a level of morphemes, where uh, there's an arrangement of phonemes that allows the formation of many meaning-bearing words. <clears throat> so, human language, what's du dual in the duality of patterning? Well, the pattern of non-meaningful elements, phonemes, that are uh, arranged into meaningful elements, morphemes. Animal communication systems don't have phonemes, that is, they, their signs are not made up from smaller parts that in themselves don't mean anything. So a part of a bird song is still a bird song, and in contrast, a part of a word is no longer a word. 
Lying is a design feature of language. Would you have thought that? Human language can be used to communicate ideas that don't correspond to fact. So you can say things like, oh, it wasn't me. Sorry. I have no idea where it went. And lying is absent from most animal communication systems. I've given you a picture here of a mockingbird. And uh, mockingbirds are perhaps the closest thing that the animal kingdom has in the way of a liar. Uh, because mockingbirds can imitate other species, but they don't use this maliciously to trick other animals. Okay, they, they do this, but there's no harm intended. Uh, chimpanzees, well, they can deceive others by hiding. So they fetch an item of food um, in such a way that competitors who would also like the food don't see them. And you might say, well, that sort of borders on lying that is uh, already going into this lying uh, kind of behavior you can call it tactical deception deception yeah um, but um, going on record saying something that is factually not the case that is something that is reserved to humans Reflexiveness. Human language is often used to communicate um, about language itself. Okay, so you can comment on a thing that you've said. You can say, well, I didn't say that. Or uh, you could say, the sentence that you're reading just now contains a relative clause. So, meta language in a way. Animals don't communicate about communication. So the bees dance, to come back to it, is about food and food only. It cannot be used to talk about anything else. So uh, a bee couldn't use the dance to say, oh, this bees dance, it so gets on my nerves. No, that's not what this is for. And so the bees dance, impressive though it is, is not language. Coming to the 15th and last criterion here, learnability. Human language users can, with enough effort, learn any other human language. A side note here, human language really is the only communication system that is wildly different across the species. So human language is mutually unintelligible in most cases. You can only talk to a fraction of your own species. That's not the same in animal communication systems. Um, now animals usually cannot acquire the communication systems of other species. Uh, parrots cannot acquire the communication systems of you no know, middle European bird songs, blackbirds for instance. I don't know if anybody has tried teaching them but certainly they have not done so spontaneously. Um, the literature, of course, is full with animals that have had rudimentary successes in learning uh, human language. Okay? People have tried to teach animals human language. Alex the parrot, you've seen him. Washoe, um, Nimchimsky, I invite you to, to Google these and other animals and uh, marvel at their successes. They're amazing, but, well, they haven't picked up language writ large. So, how do human languages differ from animal communication? I'd like you to hit pause on the video, go through the pictures, and uh, go through the design features of language that I talked about in the last minutes. All right, and with that, I'd like to leave you, and uh, I'll see you all next week.